Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, my co-host Joe Stewart and I interview inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. I hope you're having an absolutely wonderful day. I'm having a great day myself so far. I am excited. As I mentioned in the last episode, we'll be putting out an episode every week for the rest of the year. Well, at least until Christmas. This is because as well as releasing our episodes with Yoga Australia, we have many other amazing interviews we really wanted to release, including our conversation today with Manoj Diaz. Manoj Diaz is a yoga and meditation teacher, the co-founder of A Space Meditation Centre in Melbourne, and he teaches all over the world. Now, it might just be me, but sometimes you can witness someone's career from afar and maybe feel a little bit envious of the success they have had. And then you meet them and it just all makes sense. This person is the real deal. Well, Manoj just happens to be one of those people. The guy just seems to emanate a sense of calm, clarity and kindness. He's a genuine and wonderful teacher and I was glad to have the chance to speak with him for this episode. His success didn't come without struggle, of course, which you'll hear about shortly, but before we get into the conversation with Manosh, I just wanted to let you know about an amazing event we have coming up at our studio, Garden of Yoga. Our workshop with Amy Bell, Guiding Inner Journeys, is coming up very soon on the 12th and 13th of October, so it's your last chance to book in. This is a two-day workshop aimed mainly at yoga and meditation teachers or anyone wishing to enhance their communication skills. In the workshop, you'll learn how to communicate effectively, verbally and non-verbally, how to connect deeply with all walks of life, how to read people accurately via non-verbal cues, and much, much more. We had a really fun conversation with Amy for the podcast a couple of months ago, so for more details, you can check out our show notes at podcast.flowartist.com. Joe and I will both be at the workshop, so come and join in the fun. All right, that's more than enough from me. I know you want to hear from Manosh, so let's get in to our conversation with Manosh Diaz. So good to have you here today. Perhaps we could just start with you telling us a little bit about your background and where you grew up. Oh, sure. So first of all, thank you again for, for having me here and for having me in this very beautiful and colourful space. Oh, our pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> so my background and where I'm from. So I was born in, in Sri Lanka many, many years ago and I migrated to Australia when I was six. My formative years in Sri Lanka, I remember a lot. A lot of the things I remember were around the, the spiritual feelings of, of what it was like growing up back then. And, and I lived in a place called Benthoda, which is down south in, in Sri Lanka, but I went to school in, in the city. And, you know, like growing up in Sri Lanka, it was really like just a beautiful, beautiful place to live. I remember monks lining the roads as we were driving. I remember the sounds of the temples and the chanting in the morning. And you know, I really missed that when I migrated to, to Australia when I was about six. My family, for whatever reason, decided to move to, to far north Queensland to, to begin with when they came here. It was an interesting choice of location, <laughs> considering there were no other Sri Lankans there. Like there weren't anyone from, from my memory, like not many other people from different backgrounds living where we lived. So it was a very rough sort of upbringing those first few years there. And then we migrated to Victoria and kind of regional Victoria, you know, near Bacchus Marsh and, and Melton. And I've been Melbourne based ever since. I'd love to find out a little bit more about the Theravada Buddhist tradition that you grew up with. And yeah. like, could you describe that tradition for us? Yeah, yeah. So the Theravada tradition is known as the the first school of Buddhism, if you could call it that. It's the most conservative style of, of Buddhist practice as well. And it's probably the closest to the original teachings, depending on who you speak to. <laughs> I'm sure everyone thinks that they're the closest to the original teachings. Exactly, exactly. So you know, the emphasis there is on liberating ourselves from suffering. And to give you a really quick rundown of the different variations of, of Buddhist practice, one of the easiest ways to think of it is that the Theravada tradition is about uh, liberating ourselves through suffering. The Mahayana, which came a little later on, are known as the, the greater vehicle, the Mahayana tradition is most prominent in you know, Tibet, Indochina, that sort of region. And the emphasis there is on not liberating ourselves until everyone else is liberated. So there's a heavy emphasis on compassion and heavy altruistic emphasis in, in that practice. 
And then there is the Vajrayana tradition, Vajrayana practice, which if you want to think of the first one being liberating ourselves, second one being liberating everyone. The third one is like, I want to liberate myself and everyone as quickly as I can. <laughs> so those are the, the three most prominent schools. And there's also variations. There's, you know, the Pure Land tradition, Zen tradition, Nichiren, Buddhism, lots of different um, styles and, and practices within that. But they're the three main styles. There is a heavy emphasis in the Theravada tradition on, on meditation practice. There is also a heavy emphasis on ritual, on chanting, on community, on, on sangha, as we call it. But, you know, for for much of my life, that was my, my understanding and my teaching. And it started with the, the rituals, you know, started with that, started with the chanting. My family did it. It's very ingrained into in a Sinhalese culture. And for the vast majority of my life, it's been in that training. But over the last few years, two, three years, it's kind of branched more into the Vajrayana teachings. And for me, that's been largely because a I hit somewhat of a roadblock in my personal practice after a little while. And then my teacher at the time, who I'd been studying with for you know close to seven, eight years on a daily basis, moved away and he was traveling and teaching in Europe. And there was a little part of me that had a lot of questions but had nowhere to go for answers. And the, the questions I was asking of the teachers that I had access to, I didn't feel like they resonated with me. And yeah, you know, by again, a strange set of circumstances, I met uh, teachers in, in the US, in New York, that were all in the one tradition. And I started to learn a more embodied practice. And that's really when it really evolved from what I'd always known to, to exploring these di new different styles and, and sides of the Buddhist practice. And so it's really great hearing about your journey and kind of sharing something that's very much ingrained in your culture and something mm. you grew up in and then eventually kind of branching out in different directions. And mm. I've come to yoga from a completely different perspective. And mm. so because I'm teaching something that comes from another culture, there's questions about authenticity and about appropriation that come up and mm. authenticity to the practice itself, but also being authentic to who I am and the life that I live today. Mm. I'd really love to hear your perspective on those issues. Yeah. And thank you for asking that question because it's, it's a loaded question. You know, essentially what we're asking, uh, what we're discussing is authenticity and, uh, and appropriation. Uh, and you could also put in appreciation and appropriation to that as well. But it's a conversation that is happening more and more in you know, the wellness world, which really is, you could argue, what the world I kind of exist in. And it's a fine line that I don't have any strong answers for. I think when we look at appropriation of traditions, of practices, of, of people's livelihood, then it's a, it's a slippery slope. We've all seen you know, all the hysteria in the US about you know, people wearing blackface and then wearing you know, a Native American headdress and things like that. Yeah, it seems like that's very much on one side of the line where you're like, yep, I can see from here that that is wrong. Yeah, yeah. But and then, then there's the stuff that's more nuanced. There's a nuanced stuff. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's where it's really healthy to ask questions. So, you know, go, we go into Swadhyaya, which is our yoga practice in general, right? Like, how am I benefiting from what I'm doing? And a lot of the time, I think we live in a culture where, uh, you know, the dominant culture being traditionally the, the white heterosexual male has colonized, you know, certain areas and, and certain countries. And there's been benefits from that, both from a capitalistic framework, but also from a cultural framework. Ultimately, there's a, a sense of profit that comes either monetarily or in, in different ways. I think a lot of the time, like we have to ask the question, like who is benefiting from what I'm doing? And an example might be, you know, doing a yoga class where there's chanting. And you might say, okay, we're honoring yoga. And, you know, this is where it gets nuanced. And like, yes, there is an, an honoring of the yoga practice, but how are we honoring these people? And who exactly are we honoring? Are we honoring our yoga studio that's going to make lots of money from, you know, us holding this event? Are the people that were the traditional custodians of this practice benefiting in any way? Why not? Or why? And are these people even represented in the spaces that we're, you know, holding these events? So, for me, it's always asking a question like, you know, what's in it for me here? Uh, am I honoring where it came from? Am I honoring the roots? Am I even honoring the practice itself? And, you know, I, I don't like to give strong answers on these things because I feel like it's it's up to us as, you know, yogis and meditators to really come up with the, with the answers ourselves. But it's a, it's a slippery slope that, you know, more and more people need to um, bring their awareness to. And, you know, similar to the way that you're asking me, I think it's, you know, it's in asking ourselves when I go and get that Ganesha tattoo on my back, like, do I really understand what it means? Am I really a practitioner of, you know, Ganesha and do I know the history of that? Or do I want to show the world that I do yoga? 
you know, and now. Uh, or do I just think it looks cool? Do I think it looks cool? And, you know, this is where we, we have to really do our research because we live in, in a time where it's sensitive. And it's not just that we're sensitive. I think there's just more awareness of these things. And, you know, for the longest period of time, the Native Americans have been oppressed. Uh, for the longest period of time, our, you know, traditional custodians of this land have been oppressed. But, you know, we tend to knowingly or unknowingly appropriate their culture where there's benefit for us. And I think we need to, to ask questions about that and make changes, you know, and, and appreciate the culture without necessarily appropriating it. I think as well, there's something else that comes up in the yoga space and the yoga world where people want to focus on the positive And this is a practice to help you relax and help you deal with the other stresses in your life. So Mm. sometimes there's a bit of resistance or just not feeling like it's an appropriate space to ask hard questions and to ask questions that don't have a happy answer. Yeah, and and I think that that in itself has been an appropriation of the practice, right? Because when we get on the mat, we're always asking hard questions of ourselves. Like, why am I here? I could be sleeping. You know, yeah. why am I <laughs> going through my tenth round of you know Surya Namaskar? Like, well, we're asking ourselves these questions, and I think I think it's it's really interesting if we think that this practice or spirituality is is just love and light. You know, and um, I think it can be for sure, but it's also full of all the other parts of of life, which are are not so pretty, which are a little bit ugly, which are painful, which are full of suffering. And it's important that we include all of these as part of our practice. Otherwise, it's almost spiritual bypassing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we use our practice just to not feel. And, and that's not really what I, I learn. That's not really what I teach. Yeah, it's almost the opposite of like we do these practices so we are able to feel and we are able to comprehend Absolutely. all aspects of life. Yeah, and you look at qualities like ahimsa and stuff like that, you know, nonviolence, like, you know, where are we creating violence in our practice? Mm-hmm. You know, where, were, where, where are the people that created these practices? You know, an interesting thing when we talk about appropriation is that, you know, oftentimes we're very welcoming of certain elements of a culture like the food yeah like the food you know but then are we as welcoming of indian people in our spaces you know um why are they not represented sri lankans or indians or south asians in marketing of yoga studios and Mm -hmm. things like that but we get a beautiful girl in a bikini in a beach it's usually white and there's nothing wrong with that mind you i I personally have an issue with it but i think it's it's important we consider where we can bring these people into the conversation and and make it a truly liberatory practice. I think as well, like, bring them in in a real way, Mm. not just in a, like, ticked that box way. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'm really glad you said that, yeah. And it actually reminds me, I've just finished, well, we've both finished reading uh, Skill in Action by Michelle Cassandra Ah, Johnson. That's my friend. She's such such an amazing book. Yeah, she's such an amazing human as well. Yeah. 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 We're hoping to get her on the podcast, actually. But If you're listening to this, hi, Michelle Cassandra. (laughs) (laughs) And, like, what I loved about her perspective as well is so much of it was about love and about being heard and about poetry and about self-expression. Like, it's she's asking those hard questions but also, like, shining light back on the people who are asking that question of themselves. Yeah, and, and I think it's an uncomfortable conversation, you know. Mm. Like, I think we, like you said, we, it's a difficult conversation for many of us to broach, especially in this wellness, yoga, meditation community. So we'd rather not have the question. And in that process, there is harm that's that's occurring, whether we know it or not. And I think asking ourselves these questions is the first stage of transforming it. And for me, that is the yoga. You know, th- that is where our work begins, is that we can be truly inclusive we can be truly diverse. We can ask ourselves hard questions and we're not running away from ourselves all the moment. About asking these difficult, potentially ugly questions, mm. how do you go about, say, skillfully guiding people through those types of experiences? I think the only way to do this and the only way to ask hard questions is with compassion. Mm-hmm. You know, we, I oftentimes will do this, but it's always with the intention of holding this person, you know, like, like they're in my arms because oftentimes where we are byproducts of conditioning that we have no understanding of, that we have benefited from, that we don't even know we're benefiting from. And it can at one on one side be something in which we educate and it can also be something that we really inspire in others as well. So oftentimes when I've had this conversation, oftentimes people, you know, we call them dominant culture. Michelle Cassandra refers to dominant culture. They feel quite triggered because, you know, it's like 
it's like you saying, oh, but I've always lived these ethics and I've got Southeast Asian friends, I've got black friends and blah, 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 blah. Yes, and you're also benefiting from the way the world is at the moment, which mm-hmm. is you are in a dominant culture. So it has to be done with with compassion and compassion shows itself in, in two ways. It's the, the fierce side, which is, you know, not going to stand for social issues that are going unheard and isn't going to stand up and, and speak. But it's also with the understanding that, you know, this is a human being and they also have the, the potential to liberate from their suffering and the suffering of others. So the short answer is is with kindness and gentleness and compassion. At least that's that's my way of doing it. I think as well, like, it's unfair that the person in the dominant culture has to have their feelings treated with extra special care Mm. when often the person in the oppressed culture just doesn't get that. Yet at the same time, it can be really polarising if, because I've seen this online so much, like someone Mm. will just comment on something that's really true and the person who gets asked that comment is super reactive and Mm. it's really polarising and they just go straight to being anger and feeling like they're being attacked. Yeah, And it's like, yep, they needed to hear that but expressed in that way, it didn't actually mm. progress their understanding of this issue. It just made them really defensive. Yeah. It's like such a tough situation because it's like their feelings seem to be more important, which they're absolutely not, and yet to get to a better place for all of us, mm. if people get really triggered and really angry, it just, like now it's worse. Now yeah. there's a bigger disconnect between... Well, I feel like sometimes it's good to feel that as well. You yeah, know, like that's part of the process. Yeah, and, and, you know, again, it's not the way I do it personally, but I feel like sometimes it's good to be rattled a little bit into, mm. and I guess, into being like, oh, okay, I didn't expect this. And and that's like that's the moment for us to liberate because that's when we feel the most alive, right? Where, mm. where something within us doesn't feel right and we're like, oh, okay, what is this? And oftentimes when we experience that as humans, we do one or two things, we fight or flight. And what we're being asked to do is to not do either is is to hold both of these different desires with compassion like can i just be here feeling vulnerable feeling like i'm attacked but also feeling compassion for where this is coming from because it's so nuanced depending on where you're asking this question like in the us having this conversation is much more nuanced than it is here here i feel like the conversation is just starting you know, just starting, but in the US, this has been going on for a long time. Then let's go to India where this conversation even starts and it's different altogether. So it's complex. There is, I don't think, one right way of, of doing it. In my personal experience and in the Buddhist practice, it's always with the intention to benefit all beings. So for me, I don't, I personally don't see the value in alienating someone. I see an opportunity to educate someone but yeah, that's just the way I'm kind of built and that's the way I, I tend to, to teach. That's a lifetime of Buddhist practice for you. Yeah, yeah. I guess as well, that's when the next question comes in. So if someone has had a really strong reaction and feels attacked or mm. whatever, it's like, well, the next question is why have you had this response? Like it must have sparked a realisation that there's some truth in that because otherwise mm. you just let it slide by. Yeah, and, you know, I think we all have our, have our ways of dealing with unpleasant feelings. Yeah, I'm, I, you know, I've, I've moved away from making blanket statements because we don't really ever know. You know, it, it's, it's, it's complicated and it's nuanced and I feel like for, for each of us it's, it's finding our own way of having this conversation. I think just having the conversation is, is the first place to begin with because it sparks interest. And the more I've done it these, you know, last, this last year, the more people have been like, oh, I didn't even realize. I didn't even realize I was causing harm. I didn't even realize like I was oppressing this minority. And sometimes that's enough because, you know, the seed has been planted that, you know, might come to fruition years down the track, but it's still being planted. And I think we have to create space for that as well and not just go in there with our agenda and be like, I want this, I want it now, let's do it. I think it's, it's more nuanced than that. And I guess that applies to everything that happens in a yoga and a meditation practice. Like there is no one right way that's mm. going to work for everyone. And if you have a really concrete set goal, that this is what I want this practice to be like, this is what I want other people's experience to be, yeah. it never really works out. No. Like all we can do is just be present. Yeah, totally. Yeah, well said. Well, this might be a complete left turn. but um, I love left turns. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I remember you mentioned that uh, Theravada is the most conservative of the Buddhist practices. And I was 
wondering, did you have a very strict upbringing? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah. And I'm not sure if that was uh, entirely because of the, the Buddhist practice, mm -hmm. but I think it's also cultural. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, my, my family left a pretty comfortable life in Sri Lanka to, mm -hmm. at the time there was a war going on and they wanted to give, you know, me and my brother the best possible opportunity of, of life and to flourish. And, you know, like traditionally we work hard, like Sri Lankans are very hard workers mm -hmm. and for a family to uproot itself when it's you know, successful in Sri Lanka and to come here and start from the bottom, there was a lot of pressure that was, that was placed on that, you know, placed on us. And at the time, like I hated my parents for it, for sure. But, you know, I think as you go older, you, you realize the sacrifices people make in order for you to have the life that you're having. Did you find yourself at all when you're growing up sort of pushing back against your religion? Did you, did you struggle? I mean, uh, the case of Westerners and a lot of Christian upbringing, many people, I guess, almost rebel. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. So when I came to Australia, like the first few years, we still had that that strong sense of spirituality and religion in our in our, in our household. But as I kind of grew up, and as we moved to more metropolitan areas, we weren't surrounded by temples. We weren't surrounded by monks and teachers. So yeah, for you know a good portion of my adolescence to my mid twenties, like I really wasn't practicing. Mm -hmm. um, with that being said, I had this sense of spirituality within me. Like I would always just contemplate life and meaning and purpose. And, and I was always a very compassionate and generous person, but I couldn't reconcile that with my Buddhist practice. It was more like I was feeling these things, but what does it mean? Like I wasn't seeing my teachers, like it was all just a very confusing time. And it wasn't until my late 20s that I really met my teacher. I went deeper into the practice and, you know, eventually there were periods where I thought I was going to, to be a monk and I wanted to, to really explore my spirituality at a deeper level. But for whatever reason, chose chose not to, to go down that path. Maybe it is that generosity of spirit that you've just mentioned, like rather than just being a practice for yourself, like you've just been driven to make your life about sharing this practice. Yeah. I think it was also like probably very selfish. Like I wasn't ready. Like Yeah, I, yeah. I'm not cut out to be a monk. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, you know, I love the footy. Like I'm going to have to give up the footy. Like what am I going to do? You know, like I think for whatever reason, like at, at that point in my life, like it wasn't the right time. That doesn't mean in the future it might not happen. You know, I always contemplate it. Like it's always there in the back of my mind. And what was it about this teacher that really brought you back into the practice? It was just unconditional. Mm -hmm. And I think... As much as my parents love me, they love me with conditions, you know, like it was like, especially for me growing up first generation, it was like, there was a lot of pressure. They bought, you know, what their parents had taught them. But here there was a teacher, like there was a man that was just so loving in an unconditional way. Like he would take in people that couldn't afford to pay for classes. He would cook meals for people that hadn't eaten food. He would never turn anyone away. People that were suicidal, people that were extreme mental health disorders. He would welcome them. He would treat them like brothers and sisters. And I'd never seen anything like that before. But there was also a, a transmission. Like when I met him, there was something so special about him that I felt it like within within my body, within my, my bones. And I think there are very few teachers that uh, I've had that experience with. And, you know, I still, to this day, I can't reconcile it in my mind. It's not like I can say, oh, it's because he meditated 10 hours a day. Like, I sometimes think he probably didn't for a big period of time meditate at all. But there was just something in which I would come one day to have coffee with him and he could just look at my, my eyes and he knew exactly what was happening. And he would be like, how are you dealing with this? And I'm like, how do you know that? <laughs> what the hell's going on? And it was just really special. And, you know, he taught me how to understand my mind. And he taught me to be unconditional in, in my generosity and unconditional in my spirituality, but also to not identify with it as well. Because we talk about Western adaptation of spirituality, like sometimes we can take it on to the point where we just go down this one very specific path. We turn our backs on conventional life or, you know, we start to tell people off for living their life a certain way. And he really taught me not to identify with anything. So he said, like, if you're going to buy clothes, buy clothes, nice clothes. If you're going to dance, dance. You know, if you're going to, um, you know, I don't drink often, but he knows if you're going to drink, like, drink, get drunk. But then realize the impact these things mm -hmm. have on your life and don't identify yourself with being this spiritual person because that's another identity that we wear. Just like the identity of a businessman or identity of someone that's a victim, it's another coat that we wear that can cause us suffering. 
I guess that links us a little bit back into like your early 20s where you worked in marketing, right, mm. and kind of had a really high-powered, high-pressure mm. career. Mm. And do you want to share a little bit about that time? And yeah, yeah. It's a, it a very interesting time. Like I, yeah, to be completely honest with you, I um, – Grew up thinking I had to have the white picket fence, the the wife, and you know enough money to to have kids and to live a comfortable life. And I got to a point where that was almost the reality for me. But I was deeply unhappy. There was a, a an inner calling in me that kept on asking, like, what is it that I'm meant to do? Because this doesn't feel like it's my life. You know, I can't see myself crunching numbers and working for this financial institute. It just didn't feel right at all. And you know, life has a funny way of giving you the answers that you ask for. And for me, it came first with a, a pretty serious panic attack that I had at work. And I've probably been operating under anxiety for about two, three years. That was probably misdiagnosed or undiagnosed at the time. And it became misdiagnosed as ADHD. And the psychotherapist, psychoanalyst, psycho one of the one of them, anyway, kind of said it was you know ADHD, and they gave me medication, developed an addiction to to the the prescription medication that they gave, and then I had a really bad case of uh, insomnia, like chronic insomnia, and the same therapist gave me um, sleeping pills to to manage that, and then there was this little period of time where I was you know, addicted to sleeping pills and addicted to Ritalin, which was you know medication for ADHD and it was spiraling I was spiraling you know out of control and my mind felt like it was just away from my body and um yeah like I had a bit of a breakdown like this panic attack was you know a bit of a breakdown for me and I couldn't work for a period of time and um yeah it was very dark days for me you know I didn't know what my life had come to and uh, what I was going to do with it and how I was even going to claw myself out of this level of suffering. But as fate would have it, I met my teacher. He reintroduced me to the Buddhist practice, to meditation, to gentle yoga, and I started to, to heal myself. And you know, I, I don't say I started to do it because it was very much with the support of a community of people. But yeah, like that, that life that I was living was not that it wasn't for me, but I just didn't have the tools to manage it. Well, and especially when you went and asked for help to a mental health professional, it sounds like that was exactly the wrong type of help. And that just, yeah. you know, put you in like a deeper hole of suffering. And I think for me, and, and I think that's not to say it was the wrong advice. I think it's medication and everything has its place. But for me, for whatever reason, it wasn't the right treatment. I felt for me personally, it was very quick. Like the, the diagnosis was very quick and it felt like a very quick transition. Like you've got this, take this. And, you know, I had no idea about yoga, meditation. And when I discovered it, it was like a, a light bulb went off and I was like, holy shit, like I could have saved myself so much suffering if I had done this earlier on. But I also know that, that this was my path. You know, I had to go through that level of suffering to understand other people's suffering. Yeah, well, you'd have this next level of empathy for anyone else who is struggling yeah. with those issues. Absolutely, absolutely. And are there still practices or strategies that you employ today to help you manage anxiety? Yeah, like I, I don't get it as as much now, if if at all. Like, I, And this is the thing, I feel like we all have anxiety to, to some extent. And I think it can be like this you know, taboo topic of this person has, this person hasn't. But, you know, like I, we go through moments when we have an anxious moment and, you know, now I have the awareness that, you know, this anxiety isn't who I am. It's something that is impermanent in nature, just like everything else. So if I can just hold this experience with compassion, just be gentle to myself, not freak out, then it'll be okay. It's not going to kill me, you know. And I also, you know, have little techniques like breathing exercises and uh, I also know what foods to eat and not to eat. And, you know, if I have too much coffee, I'll get anxiety. And it's completely nothing to do with my mind. It's just like this stimulant just has this effect on me. So there are there are strategies that I have. But also for me, it's more the understanding that this is a human experience and it's it's okay. And I guess as well, this is a message from my mind or my body. Like I'm not talking about chronic anxiety and debilitating anxiety, but just when you have that little anxious moment, it's like, okay, why am I feeling like this? Have I scheduled too many things in yeah, this day or totally. have I not had enough rest? Or Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There's, always, there's always causes and conditions, you know. It's not like it just naturally springs up. There's, there's different things that, that come together for us to feel that. And I know for a lot of people, travelling a lot and travelling mm. a lot for work and all of the disruptions to your sleep schedule and that extra layer of pressure if you're kind of doing big events and also keeping track of stuff that's happening at home would be a big pressure cooker for yeah. anxiety yeah. and stress. Do you have any strategies to like traveling and how you manage that phase mm. of your life? You know, I'm still working on that. If I'm like, I, it's only in the last year or so that I've really started to travel and teach. 
And I'm still now trying to work out the best way to kind of, you know, move beyond that. But yeah, you're right. You know, there are moments that I don't really sleep well on, on flights. So I'll just meditate. I don't really sleep well in different new new places. So, you know, like I'll go outside, go for walks. I'll do all that. But, you know, now I've loosened the grip. I used to like really freak out if I had a big presentation and I didn't sleep the night before. I would go into like, oh, my God, I'm going to be so bad. and Everyone's going to hate me. Everyone's going to think I'm a fool and blah, blah. And now I'm just like, you know what? This is just meant to happen. Like, who cares? Like at the end of the day, like other people's opinions are, are their opinions and no one ever wants another person to suffer. So everyone is there kind of rooting for you. So just look on the positive almost a little bit, but also don't avoid what you're feeling. Just be like, it's part of life. Hello, Ron here, just popping in to let you know about our Patreon page. Now, if you're not sure what Patreon is, Patreon is just a simple way that you can help support the podcast for as little as $1 a month. Higher tiers get shout outs on the podcast and a listing on our website. We also have special content just for our supporters and we use some of the funds to have our favorite episodes transcribed for the hearing impaired or just as a written resource that anyone can access. Our transcriptions are done by our wonderful friends at Wordslice and can be read on our website at podcast.flowartist.com If you want to support us for just $1 a month you can go to patreon.com slash flowartistpodcast Alright, let's get back to our conversation with Manoj Diaz And so do you find that it's quite a different state of mind that you go into when you are doing a presentation to a big group as opposed to a little one-on-one session or a session with a smaller group in your home studio? No, I think it's always the same for me, actually. I think it's always the same. Like if it's one person or if it's like a thousand to five thousand, like for me, it's always like these are just human beings. They, like me, want to be happy. They, like me, have hopes and dreams. They, like me, suffer. So if I can keep them in mind that these are humans and these aren't like, you know, robots that are judging me, then yeah, I feel like I can always serve them the best way possible. Oh, it sounds like a really grounded and sensible approach. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't mean I don't, you know, freak out before things, but yeah, I try to take myself out of it. Like being identified with myself causes a lot of suffering. And then I'm like, you know, it's not really about me. It's about these people. And I guess about sharing those teachings. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Another slight left turn, I guess. Uh, after, I love your left turns. <laughs> I think it's my role in the podcast to do the, the left turns. <laughs> <laughs> after working in corporate for a while, you set up a space. Would mm-hmm. you like to talk about that for a little bit? Yeah. So actually, when I left the corporate world, I just started teaching, like just like just freelancing, if you could call it, like different studios. And it wasn't until probably about four, five, four years ago now that. I was working at a studio and I started to feel like I wasn't really aligned with the studio. I was working harder than I had ever worked in the studio than I did in corporate. And I was feeling burnt out and stressed. I'm like, well, this doesn't feel right. Like, hang on, like what's going on here? And again, it was a strange set of circumstances. I was invited to this um, organization of entrepreneurs. It was like a like a, a membership club to, to give, just to talk about my, my life, you know, like how I went from having all this success in marketing and advertising to then being a teacher, essentially. And I went and shared my story and I really shared about how the practice of meditation helped me through this whole thing. And and that kind of opened up a lot of questions for these entrepreneurs. And then they started inviting me to their companies to, to just talk about my experience and to share meditation. And from there, it kind of evolved into this idea that I had where I was like, wow, like there's so many people just like me that are in these organizations that have no tools. I sometimes always think like if I had the tools of meditation and yoga, would I have left corporate? Maybe not. You know, I might have had a a very comfortable, nice, peaceful life. And I saw a lot of my friends in those places suffering. So I wanted to create something for them. So they had these tools. And at that time, if you wanted to to meditate, you had to really go to an ashram or a temple. And for a lot of people that was very confronting. And for a lot of people that wasn't accessible. You know, like even for me, I would have had to travel 45 minutes every day to go to go to a place like that. So um, I met a friend of mine and, you know, we bonded one day over this shared passion we had to, to bring meditation and spirituality to, you know, people that didn't have access to it. And it really kind of spiraled from there. We started to do some pop-ups, which meaning, you know, like a, an event here, a four-week four course here. 
And it kind of spiraled into me going to New York in 2015 or 16. And then I saw like communities starting to form around these uh, contemporary meditation studios. And I thought like we could, you know, we could do this in Melbourne. Like I, I felt intuitively like we had this ability to make this come to life. And we came back and me and my business partner at the time, we were like had two credit cards, we're like let's do it. And uh, it was literally on a hope and a, and a whim. We maxed out our credit cards. We and borrowed a little bit of money from our parents and we opened our first bricks and mortar studio. Nice. And it was a beautiful studio. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Have you been there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it was a really, really beautiful studio. And I think that the highlight for me was to see a, a community starting to form when people would come in and they would feel like strangers. And then, you know, two weeks later, they're like going out for coffees afterwards. And oh, so nice. It was so nice. Yeah, it was really nice. And so you're kind of mobile now, right? Like are you looking for a bigger space or just travelling it around Melbourne a bit? Yeah, so at the end of 2017, like we needed to find a bigger space because we just couldn't, we didn't have the space to for the students that were coming in and um, we kind of ran out of time and we thought, okay, like where is our studio going to be? Is it going to be in the north side where it always was or is there an opportunity to, to go to the south side because so many people were travelling from the south of Melbourne to come there. So we're like, okay, let's just, we haven't got a studio. There's no rent at the moment. Let's just like explore what it'd be like to open a, a pop up, you know, in the north, the south, the east, and the west, three months at a time, and let's just see how it goes. And yeah, it's been really successful, you know. Like uh, Collingwood, we've had our you know usual students come, but then we're in Cremorne at the moment, and it's a whole new bunch of students and such a different demographic. And it's really beautiful to see it, you know, really beautiful to see people being drawn to it and a community starting to form around these really ancient practices. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> you mentioned about giving people tools to survive in, in the corporate world, I guess. And, you know, one critique of, I've read of mindfulness is that it enables a type of behaviour amongst large corporate entities. I'm not sure I'm expressing this question very well, but... It enables a behavior that really, I guess, puts the onus on the individual to help themselves rather than the employer, I guess, to mm. really give a situation that is beneficial for everyone. I was wondering if you had... Yeah, I think this conversation has been going around for a little while. Mm. There was recently like a Guardian article that came out. I think, it, you know, teachers were all in hysteria about it and they were saying, what a joke and blah, blah, blah. But I actually, big part of me agrees with that article. And I think this is one of the pitfalls of taking a practice like mindfulness out of the Buddhist tradition and teaching it just as one component in itself. Yes, there's so much benefit to, to mindfulness and to mindfulness-based stress reduction. It has helped countless amounts of people. And, you know, I, I teach a lot of that. I, you know, I really respect what it's about. But I also think that part of mindfulness in the Buddhist tradition is the integration of ethics into the practice, you know, and, and the Eightfold Path is really comprised of ethics and meditation and, and wisdom, you know, and when we take just one component out of it, where you know, I don't want to use the word appropriating because I don't think it's exactly what it is, but we're taking it out of context. Mm. And part of it is, yes, we need to help ourselves, but part of it is also to know, like, how are we how are we getting stressed in the first place? Like it's, it's for me now, like I don't do many corporate functions, but I also teach people when I go in there that I'll give you strategies to you know, deal with the complexities of your life. But it's important you look at what's creating those problems in the first place. And it's not always the company's fault. It could be our conditioning. Like, mm -hmm. you know, for me, for example, my conditioning was I had to make lots of money because that's what my parents came to Australia for. So that's something that I need to look at that no corporate should be responsible for doing it, right? Yeah. But when you have a corporate company come in and they're just essentially teaching you attention regulation, then I feel like it's not that it's it's not wrong, but I, I, fe I fear that it's just, it's not complete, mm -hmm. you know? So yes, we need to pay attention. Yes, we need to develop focus, but we also need to, to look at the bigger picture. Like, is my behavior causing harm? Is my lifestyle causing harm? Is it a matter of just feeling good for 30 minutes or is it a matter of really re-examining the way I live? I think so to that extent, I think it's important that we consider the context in which meditation is being taught. And I think it's important, like even in corporate context, and it, and it takes like leadership from these organizations, right? To, to be like, yeah, okay, if I'm going to bring someone that's going to teach my people to be happy, like I need to run the risk that these new staff members might leave. And mm. maybe they don't want that. I don't know. I'm not sure yet. 
I think as well, like the whole aspect of compassion as well is so, because that's one of the criticisms, right, that that compassion element has kind of been taken out of that practice a little bit. Mm, And if you are in a situation in your life where you feel like your life doesn't have meaning when you have all of these external successes but you're still feeling empty inside, like compassion can be such a powerful way to bring meaning back into your life and to absolutely. feel like you're making the world a better place and yeah, that you matter. Absolutely. And I think, to be honest, that that's what's that's the next phase of the evolution of this practice is that I think we we have reduced it down to just attention and I think that's problematic. And many, like, you know, teachers that are new to teaching might just be teaching that because it's more palatable to people, you know. I know for, for sure if I go into, uh, like, a football club and I'm like, all right, we're going to talk about opening our hearts today. Straight away, they're going to be like, what the fuck? You know, whereas for if I start off by saying, hey, you know, like, you know when your attention slips that two seconds after the opposition kicks a goal and, you know, this happens, blah, 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 and then you blame yourself, like, that's actually not helpful. So it's, it's around finding the language for it. But I genuinely believe, like, the evolution of meditation has to include compassion. Otherwise, it's incomplete. You mentioned before that you are doing a lot more traveling these days. And what sort of things are you doing now? That's a good question. Sometimes <laughs> um, I'm not sleeping on most, most of the time. <laughs> but, um, you know, a lot of that, for, for me, a few years back, I, I came to the conclusion that it wasn't enough for me just to teach people to, to de-stress. A, I'm not passionate about that. But B, I think we're missing a, a vital opportunity to really re-examine our life and, and the life of those around us. So I look at wellness spaces as an example i look at yoga meditation healing spaces and a question i often ask myself is who's not in the room and what that really points to is like is there a single representation of diversity in in this group is there people from different backgrounds different are they able-bodied people in this class is there not able-bodied people in this class is it representation of the queer community like why you know and i think that for me Part of the reason I travel around and teach a lot is like I'm trying now to integrate my social justice views with meditation and mindfulness. And I feel like for me, this is where liberation can can occur because otherwise it becomes liberation or freedom or, you know, awakening or even happiness is just for a certain group of people. And that's fine, but I feel like it's a missed opportunity to not to not bring you know people of color along for that journey, to not bring marginalized communities you know here and abroad into the conversation, uh, and to not have representation you know, and um, not have other teachers of color or Southeast Asian teachers being represented in spaces that essentially they created. You know, so um, part of it is to teach, part of it is to talk. I do a lot of talking these days for organizations, sporting teams, but also at, at events and festivals. Yeah, I think that's so important. And what do you think are some of the key things that yoga studios and organizations could do today to make that better? I think the first question is, do they care? And I think we have to get really honest with ourselves about that because it's okay to have the conversation about it. But when it comes down to it, like, what are we prepared to do? And at the end of the day, where we live in a capitalistic framework uh, in which we all have to operate and a studio might say like, oh, it's not really that much value for me to get a, a person of color teaching yoga or meditation or to change my marketing because it's all working. I'm a profitable company and that's great. Then own that. That's fine. Uh, don't just have a conversation to have a conversation. I feel like if we want to make meaningful change, I feel like if we want to really make yoga accessible and meditation accessible for everyone, we need to look at the barriers that are stopping people being able to access it. One of them is price. You know, like why would we charge in excess of $800 for someone to learn meditation, as an example, right? And that's not to say it's wrong because the teacher might be amazing, but who can afford that? Like what people from the suburbs could afford that? My family couldn't afford that. Um, Indigenous people, you know, based on where they're located, might not be able to afford that. I mean, white people might not be able to afford that. So it's... Yeah, you'd have to be in a pretty privileged position to be able to have the time and the spare money to go and do that. Totally, from a monetary perspective. But then, you know, we look at a lot of, like I said before, like a lot of marketing in in yoga and meditation. And it's, again, not representative of Australia, I don't think, you know, because we are a multicultural Mm. place. Look at this table right now, (laughs) you know. Um, But, you know, we, we tend to have these beautiful models, you know, in, in their poses and 
I think we just have to we have to really break down and dismantle all of the the ways that we are creating harm in this practice. And I do believe there's harm there. Whether the studio owners feel like there's harm or not, it's it's really up to them. And I don't begrudge them because I know it's it's hard to to run a studio. And it's not for everyone this conversation to have, but I feel like if we want to make it really accessible, we have to look at the ways and the barriers that are stopping people. And that is like financial, that is through representation, that is through spaces that feel warm and inviting, that is through all of these combined. I know a previous guest, uh, Maylai Swan, has a really great initiative with her Bali teacher training. Yeah, like she yeah. offers some local scholarships for yeah. local people who probably never would get to go to totally. a yoga training in their country. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we do the same at A-Space. We, we leave spots open in our workshops and our courses for, for people that are underrepresented. And, you know, people that even can't afford to pay, we say, you know, you can pay us in time. And people, not everyone takes us up on that. And that's cool. Like, you know, that's, that's, our, that's our work to do because we also have to be aware that not everyone's ready for this work. But I think it's also nice to have those options and, and Mela is an amazing human that's doing wonderful things. And I think other studios can learn a lot from that. Do you just have that on your website? Like when there's the information about the teacher training, like you just put it out there as well. There are spaces available if you don't yeah, have the financial so means. For our workshops, we, we have that. So we have different ticketing options. And we also work with local community groups and we say, look, look, we've got this amount of tickets, anyone from your community that they want to go, then please let us know. We'll, we'll support. That's that a great way to do it because people mm-hmm. in that community may not even think to look at your website. Totally. So totally. Yeah. 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 A bit of an aside, but I read recently about how even requiring someone have an email address can be a bit of a barrier because nowadays to get an email address from, say, Google, you need to have a phone number. And if you don't have a mobile phone, then... Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's a slippery slope, right? Like, Mm. and, you know, like there's arguments for and against, but if we are genuinely passionate about these, these are the things that we need to do. Look at all the different ways, you know. Mm -hmm. Our our studio, for example, our old studio, it had stairs. You couldn't access it through. Yeah, we have stairs as well and a narrow walkway. And, you know, like we were getting so many people like emailing going, oh, I'm in a wheelchair. And it used to break my heart. And I'm like, oh, fuck, like we're, this is, we're causing harm. Like this person's looking for, you know, alleviation from their suffering. We can't offer a space. So our next space, like we have to have something that's easy for people to enter. Like it's, there's, that's a, a, a given, you know. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and another aside, I guess even from a hard-nosed business point of view, perhaps having a more diverse clientele that will increase the pool of students. So it's got to be good for business because I guess I see a lot of yoga studios. There are a lot of yoga studios at the moment and they're all marketing towards the same people. Mm. So, Mm. yeah. I mean, this is the thing, right? Like the more inclusive it is, the more a studio can benefit from it. Mm. But we're stuck in these old paradigms of marketing and promotion where we can't see that there's actually a benefit here. Like running a teacher training, offering like three scholarship spots to people of color is going to benefit them. You know? mm-hmm. But uh, I think, again, it, it's it's the studio and their own grip on their goals and their, you know, KPIs. And, you know, like I can't speak for all of them, but I think it's an opportunity that's going begging at the moment. Do you have any personal practices for yourself as a human being, but also for yourself as a teacher that can help you kind of tap into the energy that you want to bring to the class, especially if maybe it's been a hectic morning or a bad night's sleep, something that will just help you to yeah. ground. I'm quite fortunate because I teach mainly meditation. You know, like as soon as I'll, I teach, I go into the space of, of meditative awareness. That's not to say in the past I have been, like, you know, having a space and then being a teacher, I'm constantly negotiating being a CEO and a teacher in going from one side of the brain to the other side of the brain and it's it can be stressful. First thing I do is always I offer my teachings to my teacher, you know, and my teacher's teacher and, and the, the lineage in which I practice in. I call them into the room. I call my ancestors into the room. I call uh, the people that have taught in this lineage before me into the room. Then I, I offer myself. I say it's not about me. Like, you know, I'm not here to look good. I'm here to, to create a space for these people to, to find healing. I feel like the, the moment I do that, I get out of my own way. It's like it's not about me anymore. Like I become like a vessel, like a conduit for this practice and for these teachings. And then in the practice, like, you know, I'll take three deep breaths. I'll connect my back to the chair, my buttocks to the floor, my legs to, you know, the, the, the floorboards. And, and I'll feel embodied 
you know, and when I'm in my head is not when I'm in my body. When I'm in my body is when my best teaching comes out. So I take those first few moments to really just get into my body and be with whatever it is I'm feeling. And that sounds like a practice that would help in anything you are trying to do in your life beyond Mm. teaching, being present. You know, we live in a very neck up culture. You know, we're always cognizing or always planning or always analyzing. And the moment my practice went from the head down into the body, it started to really transform my life. So yeah, always invite anyone to just get into the body. And, you know, yoga is a great, great way to do that as well. If there was one thing, one core lesson that you'd like people to take away from your your work and everything that you've learned, what would that one thing be? <laughs> 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 that we each have the potential to liberate ourselves from suffering. The Buddha himself was just a guy, was just a man, you know, and he found practices that awakened his mind. And I see the work that all of us do in this space of yoga and meditation as being the same. We have found practices that liberate our mind. And for us, it's to to cultivate that throughout the course of our life. And once we do that, to share it, you know, and to to help others and be more altruistic. And I always say, like, the the measure of my teachings is seeing um, people living a more compassionate and present life. If I can do that, if I see it, then... I know whatever is coming through me is of service. Beautiful. Oh, well, thank you so much yeah. for sharing thank that you. and everything that you do in your life and your work. Thank you. Thank you so much thank for having you. And there you go. Again, I think Menosh is a really interesting and inspiring guy, and I was really grateful to get the chance to speak with him. For our next episode, we'll be speaking with Shamala Benakovic, the CEO of Yoga Australia. Shamala was an absolute delight to speak with and she shared some really interesting information about some of the things that Yoga Australia is currently working on and what it's like to run a national peak body that is largely made up of volunteers. In our conversation with Michael de Manincourt, he told us that one of his proudest accomplishments as president of Yoga Australia was hiring Shamala. So listen to the conversation next Monday for a little bit of insight why. All right, our theme song is Baby Robots by Go Soul and is used with permission. Get his music from gosoul.bandcamp.com. Joe and I wish to honour the elders that have brought us these wisdom traditions that we share, and we also wish to honour the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of the land where this podcast is recorded in Melbourne, Australia. Thank you so, so much for listening. Aroha nui. Big, big love.